I'm going to ask you a question. I'd like you to say the answer to this question under your breath. Don't, don't tell your neighbor, but a uh, simple question. What's the name of the last book of the Bible? All right. So, what did you say? Revelations or Revelation? What do you hear most often? Plural, right? Most often you hear Revelations. Is it plural? Nope. It's the singular revelation to John, but that's common knowledge, right? It's the revelation. You talk about the last book of the Bible, it's revelations. There are many times when common knowledge is wrong. It's common knowledge that you only use 10% of your brain. Nope. That's not actually the case. It's common knowledge that the fruit that was given to Eve in the Garden of Eden was an apple. Nope. All the Bible says is fruit. It's John Milton, centuries later, who says it's an apple. We don't have a clue. It may have been an apple. It may have been a kumquat. We, we don't have a clue. Could have been a pear. Vikings had horns on their helmets. Common knowledge, right? Nope. Vikings did not have horns on their helmets. If you were in a battle and you wanted to have something to give your enemy to grab onto and yank your head down, that's a bad tactical decision. Right? It is common knowledge that the book of Revelation tells us about the future, how it's going to unfold, that if we understand it properly, it's the key to understanding the end times, and as we read today, that there are exactly 144,000 people will be saved, and those 144,000 will be there when Jesus comes back for the thousand year reign, the millennium, and the, when there's this great battle between Jesus and the Antichrist at Armageddon. All right, that's common knowledge. Well, that's, except for the fact that Jesus comes back, the rest of that, wrong. It's all, all I just told you. It, it, it's wrong. That, that's not actually what uh, Revelation is talking about. That's re common knowledge, but uh, it's not what it means, right? Sometimes getting to why common knowledge is wrong uh, is easy. If you want to know why we see Vikings with, helmet, with horns on their helmets, it's because Richard, Richard Wagner wanted illustrations for his uh, opera, The Ring Cycle, and it was, uh, he had uh, Vikings in it. And what do you, how do you make a Viking look really tough? You put horns on their helmets. So horns on the helmets for Vikings comes from Richard Wagner. That's easy to figure out, uh, or comparatively easy. The story of why Revelation has become so misread over the centuries, that, that takes a few more minutes to tell that story, but, but that's a story I'd like to tell you today. First part of the story, I want you to imagine um, we're going to start with a newspaper. Imagine going down to the store and getting yourself a copy of the local paper or maybe the Kansas City Star. Get, get yourself a paper and, and, and think about what you do when you read the paper. You read the front page and it tells you what? Facts. And then you see the uh, opinions and you, there's the uh, letters to the editor and then there is advertising and then there's the political cartoons a and if you read one like it's something else you, you kind of, if you read the opinion page like it was the front page that, that'd be a problem, right? You have to read each genre knowing something about why it's written and how it's written to make sense of it. <clears throat> And I want you to imagine that 200 years down the road, your great, 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 great grandchild is sitting there and reading the paper. It's probably not actually on paper at that point, but reading the paper nonetheless. And uh, <clears throat> they're doing about the same thing we do, reading about the news, reading opinions. But just imagine that they have stopped using political cartoons. They're just not in the paper. That, that art, that style of newspaper writing has just died out. And imagine that this great grandchild of yours goes upstairs and finds a trunk with your name on it, and you have kept uh, newspapers from big events. Right? We keep newspapers, JFK assassination, moon landing, presidential uh, inauguration, stuff like that. And imagine your grandchild, great-grandchild, opening up that paper and flipping through, and first kind of chuckling because it's actually paper, and then gets to this thing that it, we would know as a little cart cartoon, but he or she has never seen it before. So what would they make of it? They would be confused, right? They wouldn't know how to understand it. They would know it's part of the paper. They would know that you knew how to read it, but they wouldn't know how to read it. They, they would just see a bunch of elephants and donkeys fighting. That was the situation in 
the early church when they were trying to figure out what to do with Revelation. Between uh, the third and fourth century, the early church fathers, the bishops, were getting together and they were figuring out what is the Bible. This was it, this was a, a discussion they had to have because one guy, a uh, dude's name was Marcion, was saying that the New Testament should be Luke and four books and four letters of Paul, and you should ditch the rest. And the rest of the leaders of the church said, you know, we kind of like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and we like the rest of it too. So you're wrong. But because he was out there campaigning for his version of what should be in the Bible, they had to sit down and say, no, this, this is what is the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. And so they sat down and they, they figured out what is the criteria. Here's how they decided what's in the Bible. It had to be universal. It had to be books that all the, the churches had. It had to be uh, rooted back into the first century. They didn't want any second century editions. It had to go back to the first century so that it was from Christ. It was connected. It was trustworthy. And it had to be coherent with the rest of the books of the Bible. You, they weren't going to put in any random outliers. And so those are the three criteria. That's how they decided in the 3rd and 4th century, this is the Bible. This is the New Testament. And Revelation meets those criteria. It is from the 1st century. It's coherent with the rest. It is understood by all the churches to be important. But their problem was they'd forgotten how to read it. Right? The genre that is Revelation, this genre we call apocalyptic, they had stopped writing it in the year 100. It was only They only used this way of writing from 200 B.C. to 100 A.D. And so here they are 200 years later, 3 to 400 A.D., and they don't know how to read it anymore. Right? They have just lost that skill. And so it was a really big kerfluffle. They weren't sure, should this be in the Bible? And they ended up saying, yes, it'll be in the Bible, but we're really worried that people are going to misread it and misinterpret it and be confused by it. And they were right because people immediately began being confused by it. You, you, we had a Y2K problem. Y1K? That was far worse. In the year 666 AD? Yeah, that was a rough year. Because all the churches, they're, they're looking for the end of the world or the year of Satan and all that. I mean, we, we're going to jump all over, all over from, we're going to jump from the 3rd century up to the 19th century, but just, there's a whole lot of confusion that happens there. You get to the 19th century, and uh, there's this guy named John Darby, 1827. He hurts his leg badly. I think it's a femur injury, and he's laid up for months as he's recovering. And he's on the pain medication of the day, which would be heavy narcotics, uh, morphine and the like, um, laudanum. And uh, he writes this book about Revelation. He doesn't want to waste his time. And while he's on these heavy narcotics, it all makes sense to him. He understands the book of Revelation. And he thinks, and he's one of these guys who thinks the rest of the church is corrupt. And so he thinks everyone else is corrupt, everyone else is wrong, and he understands it. He gets it. He has cracked the code. He understands what Revelation is. Dude, he didn't... He had plenty of self-esteem. So uh, he goes to America after he recovers. He convinces people there that he is right. They start having what's called the Niagara Bible Conference every year uh, and to teach that how Revelation is the timeline for the future and the end of days and all of this. And uh, there's a dude named Schofield there who is convinced uh, of this. And you ever hear of the Schofield Study Bible? That's where this comes from. Uh, Schofield, Schofield and Ryrie they are the two study Bibles that come out of this John uh, Darby, his Darbyism. He, he gets a movement named after him. There's a, the Dallas Theological Seminary is founded to teach people this. But for the most part, most people encounter the thought of John Darby, this way of understanding Revelation, through books. You all remember the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey? 1988, the end of the world. Or maybe the Left Behind series that uh, have come out. Yeah, that's, that's the more current one. Hal Lindsey was back in the 80s. Now it's the Left Behind series. That is John Darby's thought in book form. And now in uh, movie form, too. And so that's how we encounter uh, what he is thinking. So what does he think? What he thinks is, um, 
he goes back to the book of Isaiah. It says in the book of Isaiah that Israel will be refounded as a nation. After it goes into exile in 587 BC, uh, John Darby sees the promise that Isaiah makes that this nation, it goes into exile to Babylon, that, that, that Israel, he sees the promise that Israel will be remade, refounded as a nation. And it is. We call it the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. They come back and they rebuild the temple and they rebuild the wall, right? That's what happens. That's the fulfillment of the promise. John Darby doesn't see that to be the case. He disagrees with Ezra and Nehemiah. Did I tell you he didn't lack for self-esteem? And uh, he says that this is an unfulfilled promise, that Israel has still yet to be founded. And once Israel is founded, then the end times can begin. Now, the problem he has with the end times, we're going to look at the three core pieces of what he, he teaches, rapture, antichrist, and millennium. And here, we'll get to the first one right now, rapture. He says, he believes that the way that uh, you have to get the church out of the way so that when Israel is refounded, that God can work through Israel to bring about the end of time. And the way you get the church out of the way is through something he invents called the rapture. Y'all heard of the idea of the rapture? Everyone goes poof, leaves the clothes behind, and cars start crashing? Uh, the rapture. And what he bases this on is this verse in 1 Thessalonians 4 where Paul is writing to uh, these early Christians who are more the death of their loved ones. He is writing to them and saying, you will meet your loved ones again as you meet the Lord in the air. That's the phrase. You will go to meet the, your Lord in the air. Now, first century mindset, right? In the first century, where is God? Where is heaven? Up, right? Up in the air. And so if you're going to go be with Jesus, where did you go? You went up. And so, if you're going to, go, and, and so he's he's talking symbolically. He's using imagery. You will go up to be with your loved ones. Who and this is the same passage where he talks about. We do not want you to mourn as those who are without hope. Right. It, other places in the other letters, Paul uses other imagery about death. He talks about death as falling asleep, right? There are other places he talks in other ways about death. And so, either he's using different imagery to describe death in different places, and he want, he under, people understand that he's not talking literally, or he's stupid, and he is, he is changing his mind every time he writes a letter. I'd much rather believe that Paul was not stupid, but he was using imagery. Darby thinks he was being literal. And so D John Darby takes it literally and says that we will, everyone who believes will go up into the air and then all our clothes will be left here empty where everyone else will be left behind. I don't think the rapture exists. I don't think the rapture will happen. I don't think the rapture is biblical. All right. That's the first piece of his, his way of thinking. The next piece is the Antichrist, right? The idea of the Antichrist, that Jesus will come back and, and Jesus and the Antichrist will have this face off. Problem with that is the Antichrist isn't actually in Revelation anywhere. The word is not in Revelation. The word Antichrist shows up in one place in the Bible. It shows up in the letters of John earlier in the Bible. And in it, what John writes is he writes that every spirit which does not, connect, which does not confess Jesus is the Antichrist. Further, he writes another place, um, this is the Antichrist, he, he who denies the Father and the Son. Men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ are the Antichrist. He writes it in three different places, and he always defines it. If you deny Jesus, you're the Antichrist. And so, I've got news for you. Milan is full of Antichrists, right? Anyone who doesn't follow Jesus is Antichrists. He, he actually uses the plural here. So there is not one antichrist. And you, everyone who, who denies Jesus is an antichrist because they are against Christ. Now, there are beasts in Revelation. There are multiple beasts in Revelation. And uh, the beast in Revelation has, over the centuries, been identified with whoever you're at war with. And so during the uh, invade, the, um, oh, 
Christians went east, took over Jerusalem. The Crusades. During the Crusades, uh, the beast was identified with the Muslim Empire led by Saladin. Later on, during the Reformation, the Catholics thought Luther was the Antichrist and his church was the beast, and Lutherans thought the Pope was the Antichrist and the Catholic Church was the beast. Later on, Napoleon, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Red China, and the USSR are all at various times accused of being the beast being the Antichrist. Even Henry Kissinger. I mean, Henry Kissinger was not my favorite person, but even he gets accused of being the beast, the, the Antichrist, right? And then the mark of the beast has been, a, we've, that has been said to be uh, social security cards, UPC, the things we scan when we check out of the, that mark of the beast, right? Yeah. Um, the mark, none of this makes sense for the people reading the book originally. What they would have known as they read this letter originally, they would have known that in apocalyptic literature, beasts stand for nations. And the beast of Revelation is the Roman Empire, because that's the nation that is oppressing them, right? And, and you can line up the details of the beast. The beast has seven heads. Rome was founded on the seven hills of Rome, right? Seven hills. And then at that point, there had been ten rulers of Rome, and there were ten horns on one of the heads of the beast, as described in Revelation. And furthermore, one of the horns is described as, as having died and having come back to life, and Nero, one of the emperors of Rome, there, that was the myth being kicked around, that he, he really hadn't died, but he was coming back to life. And so this is perfectly crystal clear, that the beast of Revelation is the Roman Empire, and it has nothing to do with the Antichrist. And then the mark of the beast was anyone who cooperated with Rome, anyone who burned a pinch of incense and was willing to say Caesar is God, would be allowed to work. That was your work pass. If you weren't willing to burn a pinch of incense and say Caesar is God, you couldn't work, you couldn't go to the grocery store, you couldn't go to the mall. It was economic persecution. If you weren't for the state, you could not make a living. That's what was happening. And so the mark of the beast being 666, if you take uh, A and give it a numerical value of 1, B, 2, C, 3, D, 4, and you follow that all the way down, you could convert Andrew Kuhn into a number, right? You do the same thing in Greek, and you take Caesar Nero and convert his name into a number, you want to guess what number you get? 666, six, six, right? So the mark of the beast is the, anyone who is willing to say Caesar is God and thus is, is going to be allowed to work for a living. Nothing to do with the Antichrist. Right? I, to be crystal clear about this, I don't believe in the rapture, and I don't believe that there is one Antichrist. I believe that the, the beast of Revelation is Rome, who was persecuting Christians at the time. The last piece uh, that John Darby lays out is the millennium. Um, this thousand years that's talked about in Revelation 20. That it comes up, this image, the way it's taught by John Darby is Jesus will return and, and uh, will... Uh, restrain uh, and bind Satan for a thousand years and during that time uh, Jesus will reign on earth. There are some problems with this though. Revelation 20 never actually says Jesus returns. It says an angel comes and binds Satan. An angel and the servants of God are the ones who bind Satan. It's not Jesus. And so bind for a thousand years. In apocalyptic literature Numbers aren't literal. They mean something symbolic. And multiples of 10 are the, the mean completeness, right? So Satan is completely, a thousand, completely bound by the servants of God who, through, who are faithful to Jesus. That, that's what it's talking about there, right? Those who follow Jesus bind Satan by their faithfulness in following Jesus, and, and so he's not free to cause trouble. And then he is not completely bound at the end of the thousand years, which is not literal. It's, it's the time during which the people of God are faithful. It, and when the people of God are not faithful, then Satan is free to cause havoc again. So Satan is free when we are not faithful, and if we want to stop Satan acting the world, we need to actively, faithfully follow Jesus. That's what I think is we're, we're, we're looking at here. So again, I don't believe in rapture, I don't believe in the Antichrist like in the way that this is presented. I don't believe we're looking at a thousand year span of time. I believe it's saying that Satan can be bound by the act of faithful Christians. Right. In general, I just think John Darby was wrong. And you might wonder, um, how do you know you're right? 
And that's a good question. Never feel, feel bad asking that question about me. Andy, how do you know you're right? It's always an excellent question to ask. Wait till the end of the sermon if you don't mind. But, always a good question. What has happened in the last 200 years is we have discovered a lot of ancient texts, like the Dead Sea Scroll discovery in the 1950s. Um, we have found a lot of ancient texts, and among them are a lot of apocalypses. For the longest time, the only two examples of this genre we had were Revelation and the second half of Daniel. And you can't learn to read a genre you forgot to read with just two examples. But because we have found so many other examples, we have refigured out, the academics who are studying the Bible have refigured out how to read uh, the apocalyptic literature. It's like that remembering that great 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 grandchild who discovers papers and, and, and political cartoons, d discovering a huge stash of political cartoons and studying it long enough to figure out how to read it again. We have figured out how to read it again and it's just a question of who is going to be bold enough to stand up and say this is really what, what it means, right? The, it turned, those early church fathers, they were worried that Revelation was going to be misinterpreted and well, they were right. They were very right. If nothing else, remember about Revelation that the purpose is to give hope to persecuted Christians. And just think about well, those persecuted Christians. If you'd given them a letter saying, hey, I've got some good news for you, for, but it's over 2,000 years down the road, you know what they would have said? Thank you very much. I need hope for today, right? This is not the book of Revelation is not about giving us hope and getting giving us hope in, in the way and giving us like a timeline to follow. The book of Revelation was to give them hope for what happened then, and it's good news for them. It is good news for us in a similar way. It's not good news for us because it establishes this timeline. It's good news for us because it tells us yet again that no matter what happens, no matter what we face, that if we have a continued faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to get through it. In the same way that they got through back in the years 94, 95, we can get through whatever it is we could ever possibly face today. The good news of Revelation is no matter what the persecution is that we ever face, God wins. Hold on to your faith, and God wins. Thanks be to God. Amen.